Hey, welcome to Legal Listening, where audio obiter is our thing. We're Carly and Zach, and we're so glad you're here with us today. So today on the podcast, we have the Queen and Haymayer, which I learned about in evidence as an example of how eyewitness identification is actually much faultier than we think it is. And it's not actually an eyewitness identification isn't actually stellar evidence, you know, in terms of a trial, especially something this serious because it was a sexual assault. It sounds familiar. I'm sure I took it in evidence, but that's the one thing about like going through law school is I don't remember all the cases I read in all the substantive law classes I was in. (laughs) So I definitely, uh, when you mentioned it, I definitely remember learning it but like the substantive aspects of it have just escaped my brain during bar studying yeah no it's totally for for me it has like particular relevance I think the only reason it ever sticks in my brain is because it's about Paul Bernardo really because Hayne Mayer goes to prison for something that Paul Bernardo did because he feels like this eyewitness evidence is so strong he just absolutely has to plead because otherwise he'll go away for longer and it's just because where I'm from because like I'm from the Niagara region and so I grew up hearing about Paul Bernardo it was kind of like a boogeyman scary story when we were kids so uh yeah the second I read this it was like one totally overwhelming that law and order had lied to me for so long about the strength of eyewitness evidence and then also uh it just had a personal connection to me so it's one of those things that sort of just got lodged in my brain plus I actually think it's a pretty good decision and it's one of those instances where you know like defense and the crown sort of came together to right a wrong which they talk about in the decision which is definitely like nice it's nice to read I think the most striking thing about eyewitness evidence is how different it is in law versus what we expect in our day-to-day lives because everybody knows they're someone's old aunt uncle in-laws like i thought i saw you driving your car today because there was a dude who looked exactly like you today zach and i was like i didn't leave my apartment in four days yeah (laughs) so it's no it's just yeah well i mean your eyes trick you all the time it's one of those things where it's like like i remember being 19 and driving out in like the boonies and niagara visiting a friend and i like Almost drove off the road because I thought I saw a ghost. Like, I didn't actually see a ghost. It's just, like, sometimes our eyes are fallible things, and it's not great. So, yeah, it was neat to see how sort of they build this narrative of eyewitness evidence being sort of rock solid. And it's like, actually, people are kind of bad eyewitnesses. And the idea that sort of, you know, the more someone thinks they're very good at it, the worse at giving eyewitness evidence they actually are. Like, confidence in what you saw doesn't actually equate to accuracy of what you saw. And I definitely think this is something we see a lot more of in other types of evidence, too. Um, I think, like, the classic case right now that you see on, like, the Netflix documentaries is, like, bite mark evidence, right? I think we need to understand that a lot of the evidence that we see on TV isn't necessarily as rock solid as we like to believe it in and especially as we move into legal practice that we need to understand that maybe what we thought was good evidence in our day-to-day lives is not up to par legally yes like there's sort of like colloquial good evidence and then there's actual good evidence and it's weird too how you know science changes and gets stronger and new areas of science develop and you know all these things because i remember sort of early the my birth year early Uh, Law and Order episodes, they're like, DNA is junk science. It's pretend. And you're just like, well, no. And actually, like, DNA has been used to exonerate a lot of people. But, you know, you never really know if something's going to be DNA and sort of get stronger and more accurate with time or if something's going to be, like, phrenology, which is going to be, you know, totally debunked as absolute nonsense. So it's weird. It's definitely, like, it speaks to how lawyers should sort of, you know, definitely keep up on the science side of things, just to sort of inform themselves on the evidence side of things, you know, like they sort of feed into one another. Yeah, and they need to ensure, or I guess what we need to ensure is that when we learn about science, we get it from reputable sources. Because what is the one case, the forensic pathologist from Toronto, his name always escapes me. Um, Anyways, he was a forensic pathologist in a lot of child abuse cases, and it turns out most of the science or the evidence he was submitting, it comes up as um, expert evidence, right? 
how his evidence was junk and it yeah. just it resulted in people going to jail for a long time for crimes they didn't otherwise commit so yeah. i think that's the other thing we need to guard ourselves against is when it comes to learning about the science not even when it comes to putting that expert on the stand is probably you know who is this person what are their credentials and what do their peers say about them awesome well as usual uh knowledge is power and we hope you guys enjoy the queen and Hainmayer. The Queen and Haymayer, heard on June the 25th, 2008, at the Court of Appeal for Ontario. Decision by Justice Rosenberg. At the conclusion of argument in this case, the court gave brief oral reasons for allowing the appellant's appeal and entering acquittals. At that time, we indicated that we intended to provide further reasons. Almost 20 years ago, on October 18, 1989, the appellant pleaded guilty to two criminal offenses that he did not commit. The story of how that happened is an important cautionary tale for the administration of criminal justice in this province. The facts of the offenses. On September 29, 1987, at about 5 a.m., a man broke into a residence in Scarborough and went to the bedroom of the owner's 15-year-old daughter. He jumped on her back, put his hand over her mouth, threatened her, and told her that he had a knife. Fortunately, the homeowner was awakened by the noise in her daughter's room. Thinking that her daughter had fallen out of bed, she went into the hall and turned on the light. She saw a man sitting on her daughter. She yelled at him and he turned around so that she saw his face. She would later testify that she studied the man's face very closely. The man then jumped off the bed and confronted the homeowner. He stood inches from her, raised his arms, and, quote, roared, end quote, at her. He then fled the house. The homeowner told police that she stared at the intruder for 40 seconds to a minute and could identify him again. Her daughter testified that less than 30 seconds passed from the time her mother entered the bedroom to when the intruder fled. The homeowner provided a description of the intruder to the police as follows. Six foot, 170 pounds, slim build, 19 years of age with sandy, brown, wavy hair, wearing a black leather jacket and blue jeans. Although the homeowner had never seen the man before, she believed that she was particularly adept at remembering faces because her work as a teacher required her to put names to the faces of her students. She decided that the perpetrator must have been keeping watch on her daughter and on the house and likely was working on construction in the area. She drove around and looked at the various construction sites and then telephoned one of the companies working in the area. She provided her description to a woman in the personnel department and the woman gave her the appellant's name as someone who fit the description. She passed that name on to the police. In the same period of time, the homeowner helped with a composite drawing prepared by a police technician operating a computer. She also viewed about 100 photographs at the police station. She told the police that she remembered two particular characteristics of the man. He had very piercing eyes and small ears. She agreed that the composite sketch did not reflect the small ears, but she testified this was because the computer couldn't get it right. Two months after the break-in, the police showed the homeowner a photo lineup and she picked out the appellant's photograph. The investigating officer told her she had picked out the appellant's picture. The lineup viewed by the homeowner is no longer available. However, she did testify in cross-examination that the appellant's photograph was the least sharp of all the pictures in the array. The appellant was arrested on December 18, 1987. He gave a signed statement to the police in which he denied knowing anything of the crime. He confirmed that he had been working on construction in the Scarborough area that summer. It appears that he stopped working with the company five days before the break-in. The original court proceedings. The appellant was originally released on bail, but when he failed to appear for his scheduled preliminary inquiry, he was arrested and detained in custody until his trial. His preliminary inquiry was ultimately held in May 1989 and he was committed for trial. 
His trial commenced on October 17, 1989, before Justice Ferguson. The complainant and the homeowner testified on the first day of trial. On the second day of the trial, after the homeowner had completed her testimony, the appellant changed his plea to guilty. He pleaded guilty to break and enter and committing an assault, an assault while threatening to use a weapon. He was convicted on the break and enter charge, and the second charge was stayed pursuant to the Kleinapple principle. He was sentenced to two years less one day imprisonment in accordance with a joint submission. The appellant served more than eight months of this sentence before being released on parole. In an affidavit filed with this court, the appellant explained why he changed his plea. In short, he lost his nerve. He found the homeowner to be a very convincing witness and he could tell that his lawyer was not making any headway in convincing the judge otherwise. Further, since his wife had left him and wanted nothing more to do with him, he had no one to support his story that he was home at the time of the offense. He says that his lawyer told him that he would almost certainly be convicted and would be sentenced to six years imprisonment or more. However, if he changed his plea, the lawyer said he could get less than two years and would not go to the penitentiary. The appellant agreed to accept the deal, even though he was innocent and had told his lawyer throughout that he was innocent. The Reinvestigation On October 17, 2005, Paul Bernardo's lawyer sent an email to a police officer with the Toronto Police Sex Crime Unit listing 18 sexual assaults and other offenses that he believed had not been solved. One of the crimes was the break-in to which the appellant had pled guilty. The police interviewed Bernardo in April 2006 and then conducted a further investigation. They are satisfied that Bernardo, not the appellant, committed the crime. At the time, Bernardo lived two blocks from the victim's home. He, of course, was the so-called Scarborough Rapist, and after his conviction for murder, was convicted of a number of sexual assaults committed in the Scarborough area during this time period. For example, one of the rapes which Bernardo was known to have committed occurred two and a half months after the attack on this victim and was committed only a half a block from the victim's home. It is unnecessary to further detail why there is no doubt of Bernardo's guilt. The fresh evidence is absolutely compelling. In the course of the reinvestigation, the police interviewed the appellant and the homeowner. The appellant reaffirmed his innocence. The homeowner told the investigators that she had been sure at the time that the perpetrator was not the Scarborough rapist because his method of operation was different. She was also sure that the person she saw was not Bernardo. At the hearing of the appeal, counsel informed the court that the homeowner remains convinced that she identified the right person. The proceedings in this court. With the consent of the Crown, the appellant was granted an extension of time to appeal his conviction. The Crown also agreed that fresh evidence in the form of the results of the police reinvestigation and the appellant's affidavit should be admitted into evidence and that the appeal should be allowed. Given the commendable position taken by Crown Counsel, these reasons can be brief and need only address two issues, the setting aside of the guilty plea and the identification evidence. The guilty plea. In RVT bracket R, Justice Doherty explains that where the validity of a guilty plea is raised for the first time on appeal, quote, the appellate court will examine the trial record and any additional material proffered by the parties, which, in the interest of justice, should be considered in assessing the validity of the plea, end quote. Justice Doherty further explained that to constitute a valid guilty plea, the plea must be voluntary, unequivocal, and informed. There is no suggestion in this case that the appellant's plea, almost 20 years ago, did not meet those requirements. While the appellant speaks of advice from his lawyer to plead guilty, the fresh evidence makes clear that in the end, the appellant came to his own decision. His plea was unequivocal, and he understood the nature of the charges he faced as well as the consequences of his plea. On the other hand, the court cannot ignore the terrible dilemma facing the appellant. He has spent eight months in jail awaiting trial and was facing the prospect of a further six years in penitentiary if he was convicted. The estimate of six years was not unrealistic, given the seriousness of the offense. 
the justice system held out to the appellant a powerful inducement that by pleading guilty he would not receive a penitentiary sentence. Even though the appellant's plea appears to meet all the traditional tests for a valid guilty plea, as pointed out by Justice Doherty in TR, this court retains a discretion to be exercised in the interests of justice to receive fresh evidence to explain the circumstances that led to the plea and that demonstrate a miscarriage of justice occurred. As a necessary corollary of the power to receive fresh evidence in these circumstances, the court has the power to set aside the guilty plea in the interest of justice, even though many years have passed. This is obviously one of those cases. The fresh evidence proves beyond doubt that the appellant did not commit the offenses to which he pleaded guilty. One miscarriage of justice would be compounded by another if this court had no power to intervene. As I have said, the Crown agrees that this is a proper case for setting aside the guilty pleas and entering acquittals. The Identification Evidence I wish to make a few comments about the identification evidence in this case. We know now that the homeowner was mistaken. No fault can be attributed to her. She honestly believed that she had identified the right person. What happened in this case is consistent with much of what is known about mistaken identification evidence and, in particular, that honest but mistaken witnesses make convincing witnesses. Even the appellant, who knew he was innocent, was convinced that the trier of fact would believe her. The research shows, however, that there is a very weak relationship between witness confidence level and the accuracy of the identification. The confidence level of the witness can have a, quote, powerful effect on jurors, quote, see Manitoba, the inquiry regarding Thomas Sofenau, the investigation, prosecution, and consideration of entitlement to compensation. The homeowner's evidence also reveals a number of concerns that demonstrate the frailties of eyewitness identification. First, there was no circumstantial evidence connecting the appellant with this crime. The fact that he was working in the area around the time is not circumstantial evidence inculpating him, but may possibly explain why the homeowner was able to pick him out of the lineup. Research has shown that witnesses have a difficult time keeping track of where they have seen someone. See the inquiry. Second, the photographic lineup itself was the kind then in use by police, that is, presented as an array rather than sequentially. In his report, Commissioner Peter Corey referred to page 28 of the expert evidence adduced before him that photo lineups are a form of, quote, multiple choice testing, end quote. As I understand it, the danger is that the witness may choose the picture from the array that is the best fit. The witness engages in a process of elimination rather than recognition. Commissioner Corey recommended that the photo pack be presented sequentially. Third, the appellant's picture was different than the other photographs in the array. In Hill and Hamilton Wentworth Regional Police Services Board, Justices Feldman and Laforme, in their dissenting opinions, refer at paragraph 149 to the expert evidence of Professor Roderick Lindsay, adduced in that case concerning structural bias in the presentation of a photo lineup. As Professor Lindsay explained, structural bias results when one person in the lineup is visually distinct from the others in some way. This bias can cause misidentifications because the person who stands out is more likely to be picked by the identifying witnesses. Fourth, the officers conducting the lineup were involved in the investigation and knew the identity of the suspect. There is a danger that the investigating officer may, even if not consciously, convey information to the witness to cause her to select the suspect. Commissioner Corey recommended at page 32 that it is essential that an officer who does not know who the suspect is and who is not involved in the investigation conducts the photo pack lineup. Fifth, the evidence discloses serious contamination by the investigating officers. They informed the homeowner that she had indeed identified the suspect. This could only serve to increase her confidence in the accuracy of identification and thus make her a more convincing witness. As Commissioner Corey recommended at page 32, police officers should not speak to eyewitnesses after the lineups regarding their identification or their inability to identify anyone. This can only cast suspicion on any identification made and raise concerns that it was reinforced. Sixth, 
No permanent record was made of the lineup procedure. Commissioner Kohori recommended that the lineup process should be videotaped or at least audiotaped. The taped record can provide valuable information for the trier of fact in evaluating the reliability of the identification. In making these comments, I do not intend any unfair criticism either of the witness or the police. As to the witness, as I have said, she honestly believed she had made a correct identification. That identification was made in difficult circumstances. She was naturally under considerable stress when she encountered the assailant. She only had a brief opportunity to make her observations and she was identifying a stranger. As to the police, they may have been following procedures that were in place at the time. Those procedures and standards have evolved in the last 20 years. See the Supreme Court of Canada's comments in Hill and Hamilton Wentworth Police Services at paragraph 78 to 80. However, this case represents an example of how flawed identification procedures can contribute to miscarriages of justice and the importance of taking great care in conducting those procedures. Mistaken eyewitness identification is the overwhelming factor leading to wrongful convictions. A study in the United States of DNA exonerations showed that mistaken eyewitness identification was a factor in over 80% of the cases. See the inquiry regarding Thomas Sofano. Conclusion I would conclude by reiterating the court's thanks to Mr. Lockyer on behalf of the appellant, Mr. Leibovich on behalf of the Crown, for the work they have done to expedite this matter, and so far as can be done, reverse this miscarriage of justice. I also repeat what was said to Mr. Haymayer at the conclusion of the hearing. It is profoundly regrettable that errors in the justice system led to this miscarriage of justice and the devastating effect it has had on Mr. Haymayer and his family. Accordingly, the appeal is allowed. The fresh evidence contained in volumes two and three of the appeal books is admitted. The guilty pleas are set aside. The conviction for break and enter and committing an assault is set aside. The conditional stay of proceedings for assault while threatening to use a weapon is set aside, and acquittals are entered on both counts. Legal Listening is founded by Zach Battiston and Carly Lyons. Hosted by Zach Battiston, Carly Lyons, and you, our listeners. Executive produced by Zach Battiston, Carly Lyons, and Anthony Rademile. Audio engineering by Anthony Rademile. Graphic design by Julie Lundy at julielundyart.com. Music by Matt Rademile at radandkel.com. We're always open to ideas, suggestions, and of course, guest readers. Check us out at Legal Listening on Twitter and at legallistening.com. We'll talk to you next time.